Greetings, Engineering Tomorrow Nation. I'm your host, back again for another week in sunny and hot St. Louis, Missouri, down in the Chesterfield Valley, where there is little wind and a lot of humidity. Uh, Speaking of humidity, we are talking about cannabis grow rooms today, particularly indoor grow rooms. And indoor grow rooms have their own set of challenges. People have indoor grow rooms because you can grow all year despite the outside climate. And to get the most bang for your buck, to get the most crops grown, and to maximize your yield, you really need to maintain your temperature and humidity in all stages of the plant's life. We are bringing on an industry expert, Paul Stewart, who is the vice president of sales for Desert Air. And Desert Air makes dehumidification equipment and systems for your grow room. We aren't just going to be talking about dehumidification. We are going to be talking about building design for grow rooms in general, how you can greatly reduce your utility bills during your grow, uh, how you can significantly reduce mold and poor growing conditions that could, frankly, decimate your crop and make you have to start over, and how you can't take a grow room design from a very dry climate and try to replicate that in a very humid climate state. So through the magic of technology, I'm going to send you guys off to our awesome conversation with Paul. Pour yourself a coffee, maybe a tea, or depending on what time it is, a nice beer. Sit back, relax, and welcome to Engineering Tomorrow. Broadcasting around the world. This is Engineering Tomorrow. The podcast committed to bringing you the best in commercial construction, design, and engineering from the brightest minds in the industry. This is the stuff they don't teach you in school. So sit back, relax, and open your mind. You're about to get the insider knowledge to improve your next construction project or advance your career. This is Engineering Tomorrow. Here we are. Hello, everyone, from our virtual new studio in Midwest Machinery. I am Brian Gomsky, Director of Marketing and Business Development. Eric Eiler, Outside Sales Engineer. Uh, so we're pretty excited about this uh, presentation today. You probably saw in our messaging, we've actually, along with Paul, gave this presentation uh, at Missouri's largest um, medical cannabis expo earlier this year. I uh, got a lot of great feedback about it. Um, so people who couldn't attend, Wanted to make sure we could get this to you again. We also did a, a similar one at our local ASHRAE as well. So if you attended that, you'll see some see some similar information in it. So we're going to go ahead and introduce Paul Stewart, who is an industry veteran and expert in all things HVAC and uh, grow room related air quality. Um, but Paul, why don't you go ahead and... Uh, I can't do enough honors for you. So why don't you go ahead and introduce yourself? Okay. Well, very good. Well, thanks guys. I appreciate you having me uh, uh, on the screen here today and hopefully we'll give everybody a few good nuggets to take away uh, as they uh, get into the legalization of cannabis in the state of Missouri and start doing their build outs. Yeah, I'm, I'm with uh, Desert Air. Uh, I've been the vice president of sales over here for the past, uh, I'm in my 12th year. Prior to that, uh, I did 23 years with Johnson Controls in a variety of uh, management positions, uh, most notably in equipment control sales to equipment manufacturers has been my, uh, my background. So uh, that's pretty much my background. I've got an engineering degree from the University of Illinois across the state. And, uh, you know, I've been involved in HVAC equipment for the past 30 some odd years. I'm a member of ASHRAE, the American Society of Heating, Refrigeration, Air Conditioning Engineers. And I've also served on a couple of other uh, Uh, entities in the industry, such as the Model Aquatic Health Code, um, to name one. So um, what we wanted to do today is really kind of give you guys a uh, overview of what you need to do and what you need to be thinking about as you get permitted and you're headed down the path of uh, looking to make a uh, successful and profitable cultivation facility. So, uh, you know, uh, we'll give you a congratulations to begin with. You guys want a license. If you're sitting in the room, yeah. you may have got your permit. Uh, pardon? Shout I'm out. Just telling them good, good job. Yeah. There you go. 
Um, so you really got, I, I'll say, part of the hard stuff out of the way. Um, I know it's always been a challenge, and as we've done this uh, across the country now, I think we've got about 33 states that are medicinally legal. We've got 11 states that are recreationally adult use legal, and you know every state is kind of their own fiefdom, and uh, some of them also seem to be uh, a little interesting on how they do issue their permits. Um, so. Like I say, you made it through that first milestone and uh, moving towards the legal cannabis trade. So, um, you know, the next thing here is, uh, okay, you've gotten through that particular piece. Um, you know, a lot of application work. You've had to uh, put together your team. Uh, you have to, you've had to find funding. And, um, but one of the things we want to make certain is, as you put your business plan together, here's a very interesting fact that continues to happen across states that become legal. At the beginning of the legalization process, the price per pound for finished product tends to be high. And as the growers and cultivators come online and we get an increase in supply, and additionally, as the demand for product tends to level out. I mean, there, there's not an insatiable demand for cannabis consumption. Uh, just look at what's happening in Canada right now. They have built out a significant amount of, uh, of growth up there for cultivation. Uh, part of it was the intent to export that product. And you've got people laying 40% uh, of their staff off. You've got folks determining whether they're going to sell off a couple of different operations just to, to raise capital and keep things moving. So just because you grow it, doesn't mean you're going to be successful. You have to make certain that you take into consideration that over time, your price point is going to drop. The slide I have up here right now is uh, what's happened in Colorado since they legalized for adult use back in 2014. At the onset, wholesale pro product was going for about $3,000 a pound, and now it's down in, at about $1,000 a pound. Now there are, different three, there are three different price points there. You've got a price for outdoor grow, which is the lowest. You've got a price for um, greenhouse grow. And then you do have your, your highest price product, uh, which is your highest quality, your best yield, maybe more consistent product is going to be your indoor grow. So there are three price points there. But keep in mind that you will see a decline in um, what you can get for your product uh, as people come on board and supply increases and demand uh, flattens out. Paul, that's like one of the big things that we're kind of talking about here too, is it's the profitability portion of it, right? I mean, anybody can, you know, throw equipment at it to, you know, make the, make a system, you know, work okay. Right. But it's right. Uh, really diving into why this, you know, what we're going to be presenting is more effective and more critical for this. Cause that's exactly what that slide shows It's yeah, everybody's profitable in the beginning, but it's how do you sustain right. long-term and how do you be profitable without having to basically redo everything that you've done in the onset? Yeah. I think that what you have to think about is, do I want to be in business in five years? Am I doing this for a short-term gain or am I doing this to be in business in the long term? And I would hope that everybody looked at it as, yeah, I'm, I'm looking at this and being in it in the long term. And if that's the case, take a longer look view and make sure you understand uh, what may occur. You know, if you, bit, you built your business model on being able to sell product for $2,000 a pound, uh, you may be okay for a few years, but what happens when the price point drops to $1,500 a pound and you're having to sell it for below your costs? Um, you know, you, you can't continue down that path. I know there was an electronics guru years ago that we always used to kid, how can I afford to sell to you below my costs? Volume, volume, volume. <laughs> well, that doesn't always work. Um, <laughs> it's a great tagline, but yeah, that, that's not going to pay the rent long term. So uh, keep in mind what we're trying to give you is um, we want to make you help you think about what you need to do to have a successful long-term operation that has operating costs in mind, as well as first costs in mind. Uh, you can't just buy the cheapest thing out there and, and hope that that's going to sustain you through, uh, through a time period. Right. So, um, you know, on this next slide here, you know, 
a lot of issues that you're going to have to to kind of keep in mind. Utility bills will be one of your biggest expenses. And when you talk about utility bills, you're talking about electricity, you're talking water, you're talking sewer, um, you know, potentially gas. That needs to be taken into consideration. And, you know, your operating costs should be part of your equation. You know, we, we, we tend to go through this equation with folks all the time. Guys will come in and say, well, you know, I'd love to, to buy your desert air equipment, but but you're, you're 20%, 30% more expensive than what I can buy over here with, you know, these air conditioners and portables. Um, but what they fail to realize is the operating costs of the portables and the air conditioners are going to be 30 to 40 to, to 50% more expensive to physically operate to do the same work. So, you know, we just did some analysis for a, a grower the other day and the payback for my increases in first cost uh, the payback was about a year and yeah. Yeah. yeah, I mean, that was significant because uh, they were trying to figure out, well, we've always done it this way and we've always gone, we have the lowest cost equation up front um, and make it work. And that doesn't even take into consideration the increase in yield that you may see by being able to control the environment to the ideal operating uh, and plant growth environment. And so as we talk to growers, when we start talking about the impact of, of maintaining that environment, you know, are you able to get 5% greater yield by controlling to a tighter environment that you desire? Are you able to get 10%, 15%? What's that worth? And I know that part's a little harder for someone to, to understand up front. All they look at is, hey, this costs this and this costs this. Think about those other aspects. Um, and I think the other thing that we're pointing out in this, this slide here is, you know, if you don't maintain the environment properly, you will have things that can, can just decimate your entire operation. You know, mold and uh, mildew, um, if you get that in your crop, then it's tough to get rid of. Um, it can consume an entire room. And in most states, the, the way to mitigate that is if it gets inspected and, and um, it gets deemed that it's un unacceptable, you're effectively just, you know, it, it turns into scrap. Uh, you're having to discard it. So um, there are some ramifications that come into effect when you can't control the environment and, and keep a, a good environment there. All right, so obviously what we're trying to get you to is to think about uh, what's happening in the room, uh, what are the loads, um, what's the proper equipment. You know, I always say, you know, don't bring a knife to a gunfight. Uh, you know, if you know you got a battle here, bring the right equipment. And, um, you know, just because something's uh, cheap or just because something looks like it might be right uh, doesn't mean it may work for you. So... Get a properly designed system, get your, you know, and we recommend you get an engineer involved. You're going to have to have a mechanical, uh, electrical and plumbing um, stamp for your facility. So get them involved early, but also you got to make sure that you know enough about what the application is about so that it, if they are not educated in this type of an application, they don't make a mistake. I mean, I know engineers, you go back, you know, six, seven, 10 years ago, engineers thought it was a lighting issue. The heat from the light only is what they had to account for. They didn't think about what plants do. So, uh, you know, that's gonna be the, uh, the big thing is the more you guys know as the cultivation and the grower and even the finance person behind it, the better off you're gonna be able to control your destiny with what goes in, what's gonna be the most effective and then how you sustain yourself going forward. Any comments there, Eric? No, I mean, it's, you say a properly designed mechanical system. There's so many things to take into consideration with that. And that's, I, I mean, we just, we're going to kind of dive into those. And like you said, if you, it's the details that you don't know that can kind of really catch you. So. Yeah. Well, I'll throw one out just from a utility standpoint that a lot of people are now starting to think about, and that's the water consumption. So, you know, most jurisdictions charge you your water. Um, they, put, they put a meter on your water intake, and then they charge your sewer as a function of 
the water intake. What if you reclaim your condensate that comes off of your, your equipment? If the plants consume, let's just say, uh, easy math, a third of a gallon of water a day in the flower room, and you've got, you know, 300 plants. So now you're talking, you know, um, you know, 100 gallons a day uh, per plant. You've got several of those. And if you're paying for the water to come in to be used and you're discarding it all, um, you've got a pretty hefty bill there. What if you reclaim the water? The condensate that comes out of the dehumidification and the HVAC system, you reclaim that water uh, and treat it, you can probably reclaim 70% 70, 70 of that water and now your, that utility bill goes down. Now I know 100 gallons doesn't seem like a big deal, but like I say, get yourself into a facility that's 10,000, 20,000 square feet and you're gonna be going through some significant uh, water consumption. I mean, we've got our largest facility that we've done is 400,000 square feet under one roof. And uh, that 400,000 square feet, they've got 38 or 39 flower rooms uh, that have 1,500 plants each in them. I mean, that is a significant operation. You know, they've got a, they've got a hefty water bill every month and sewer bill that goes along with it um, if they're not reclaiming that water and, and reusing it. All right, so uh, as we move on here, so let's, let's look at the loads, because I think this is, uh, I know we've probably got some folks out there that aren't horticulturalists. They're, they didn't study plant uh, botany in college, and uh, maybe they were the finance guys, and they looked at this as a good business opportunity. So let's do a little bit of background on, you know, what does a plant do, and uh, how, what does a plant need to thrive? So if, if you look at plants, um, they absorb light energy from the sun or the grow lights, and they bring up nutrients from the roots, water and nutrients. Water is actually used to pull the nutrients up through the roots and move it up through the capillary system in the, in the stem and through the leaves to get it out there where photosynthesis can go on. And I know I'm going back here to, to high school science class. That's probably the last time most of us have heard about photosynthesis, but Photosynthesis occurs when the lights are, are when lights are there, and you're you're taking those nutrients and you're converting um, those minerals and, and nutrients to starches and such that the plant can use for for growth. Um, so it's growing its canopy. Uh, if it has a fruit, it's going to be growing that. In the case of cannabis, it's going to be at some point uh, wanting to um, procreate and extend its life by either growing the flower if it's a female or producing pollen if it's a male to pollinate the female. So obviously this is a, a, a no brainer, but in the cannabis facility, we are only growing female plants because we only want to harvest the flower and that is a female plant. So you gotta look under the leaves and see which plant, what, what, they, what kind of genitalia they have, I guess, but uh, <laughs> there, there, there is a whole method out there for identifying um, the plant uh, gender. And uh, yeah, you're going to want to have female plants only. And this is another interesting aspect as you get into the hemp and the farm bill that was created a few years ago. If you have outdoor grows of hemp uh, and you have the, uh, some, some pollen that's being created, uh, because maybe they're doing seed generation or whatever, or they just haven't pruned back a plant that uh, cut out one of the males in their, in their field. Pollen can float about 10 miles. So if you're bringing in a lot of outside air into your grow room, or if you're doing a greenhouse, you do have to worry about pollination um, from stray pollen. Uh, you may not have it inside your facility, but if it floats in, now you, uh, you start having these plants, these female plants that's producing the flower. Uh, they got their sticky stuff to kind of grab that pollen and, and turn things to seed to, 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 you know, to extend the life, you know, to produce the next offspring. So keep that in mind. But uh, yeah, this is what the plants are doing. We're, we're watering, we're grabbing nutrients down here in the roots. We've got our lighting energy and the plant just goes through that photosynthesis process. And the majority of the water, we typically, in a flower room, 75% of the water is consumed during the lights on period when photosynthesis is going on. 
So again, another real big point to just be aware of. All right, so when we start talking about this indoor grow, we need to think about the loads. And, it, and as you talk to your engineer, you know, and you try to decide, well, how much air conditioning do I need? How much HVAC do I need? How much dehumidification do I need? What forms of, of this are there? There are sensible cooling requirements and there are latent. Latent is the moisture removal part. That's latent is all about removing moisture and sensible cooling is just temperature change. So the lighting load is your sensible cooling load. Uh, all those lights, whether they're LED or HID, they're putting off heat energy. Uh, a watt in equals a watt out. So however many watts are going into the room, that can be converted to BTU and we can calculate, well, how much light energy needs to be offset by some sort of sensible cooling machine. So that's a real easy one. Um, the evaporation, uh, evapotranspiration is the actual form of that latent. And again, we have to account for that latent um, moisture removal uh, that needs to happen in order for the plant to continue to draw moisture up. The minor loads, and these are gonna be important, but we can negate these. Uh, for instance, the building skin loss and heat gain. So what we're talking about there is it's, it's, it's the structure around. It's the structure of the building. If you're doing rooms within a room or rooms within a building and they, are, they don't have an external wall, then you can pretty much negate the effect of any skin loss or heat, heat gain or heat loss through your room. If, the, if, if the, around the building is at 70 degrees to 80 degrees and inside the room is 75 to 80 degrees, then there's no appreciable difference between what's gonna happen from one side to the other. But if you've got an external wall and in the winter it's at 20 degrees outside and inside the room it's, you're trying to maintain 80 degrees, we will have heat loss through that wall. And again, that's where uh, you have to account for it. So we just need to know about it. And um, you know, you gotta tell your engineer, hey, I do have, I do plan to have external walls. Um, therefore we gotta account for that heat loss and heat gain. Solar gain is, is very similar to that skin uh, heat loss, heat gain, except it is the impact of sun hitting the wall and creating a radiant heat surface. So again, we negate that by having rooms within the building and not having any, any external walls. And again, if you think about the external walls, would I have greater heat dissipation or heat loss if I built my house out of a cardboard box versus mm -hmm. built my house out of a, um, you know, a brick outer skin, a two by four wall with injected foam insulation and then sheetrock on the inside. Which one's gonna have more heat loss? Obviously the cardboard box house. So, you know, all of that has to be taken into consideration if we're gonna be exposed. Uh, and the same thing with the solar gain. You know, if you have a lot of Western um, part of the building, if there's, a, you know, if all those walls that are exposed to the, um, to the external wall, if they're all facing west, they're probably gonna have more solar heat gain than a wall facing north, south, or even east. Uh, but again, your engineer can help you with that. And I, and, I, and I say the best thing to do is just go with the walls within a wall, go with the building with a room within a room. Is that typically what you see then, Paul, is essentially a room in a room? I mean, we do, um, because people are wanna, you know, they're, they're building out, you know, the, you know, a typical facility might have four, eight, flower rooms. They might have two veg rooms that feed those flower rooms. You might have one mother room, one clone room, uh, and you've got some processing area. So you are already building those out because, you know, if you think about it, guys are wanting to do maybe a different strain in the flower room, or in most cases, guys are putting the product in and it's spending eight to 10 weeks in that flower room and then you're harvesting it all. Well, you, you don't want to have just one flower room and harvest what? once every 10 weeks and then have it dry for another week and a half before you go to, before you have product available. So guys will have multiple rooms so that they can be harvesting every week that they go along. So very typical, but yeah, the, the room within a room, we see a lot of it happening uh, just because of this issue of their building rooms anyway, inside the, the building. And people have come to learn that if I get it off of the outside wall, I can minimize the impact that's going to have on my room inside. Right. 
we've seen typically here, um, you know, locally, they're taking existing buildings, right? So how are you turning yep. an existing building into an indoor grow facility? You, know, you, you just build something inside of it. Yeah, the, the freezer panel walls are the primary uh, method. You know, it's a four inch uh, polystyrene uh, skinned wall and guys can come in and put those up for very quickly. You can also get that vapor barrier uh, on the inside so that you're preventing any moisture migration as well. Um, and, and that's important as well. You want, you want a vapor barrier, right? You know, if you're trying to control what's inside the room, um, then make sure it's not seeping out somehow. Okay. Uh, and then the last one I've got down here, or, or we talked about infiltration a little bit, the vapor barrier. The other one is outdoor air ventilation. Um, now I will tell you that if you run across any folks that come from the West, Western half of the U S um, they have done some amounts of outdoor air ventilation to complement their HVAC equipment. And they can do that because they have a dry climate in Missouri, Southern Illinois. Uh, we have humidity, actually everything East of this line that goes right down through the, uh, the Dakotas, Nebraska, Kansas, Oklahoma, and Texas. There's this line that goes right down the middle of the country. Everything to the right of it has humidity uh, during summer months, or at least some part of the year. And the further south you go, uh, take the Gulf states, um, the lower Midwest, we got humidity for four or five months of the year. So... You know, if you're bringing outside air in in the middle of the summer when it's hot and humid in Missouri, how's that going to dehumidify your space? So, you you know, we always say this is not a, um, a commercial building that is required to meet an ASHRAE 62 code ventilation requirement so that we don't choke on our own fumes. It's an industrial process. You have few people in there. And oh, by the way, what do plants give off when they when they grow? They give off oxygen. So the oxygen content inside the grow room may be better than it is outside the grow room. <laughs> so I, I would say, you know, we, and we tell people this all the time on the Eastern half of the country, you need to minimize your outdoor ventilation. You don't need it. Uh, and even out West with this whole um, um, increase in outdoor hemp growing and even outdoor cannabis growing, um, it, how do you keep bugs? How do you keep pollen out of your facility? Well, if you open the windows and you're pulling in air, you not you now have to figure out, well, how am I going to mitigate bugs? How do I keep the bugs out? And how do we keep the pollen out? So correct. I mean, lighting adds heat to the room. I kind of talked about that on the previous slide. Um, and again, it doesn't matter whether it's LED or HID. Now, one thing I will comment on with regards to your lighting choice, LED lights, uh, do operate with less energy to create the same light spectrum than a traditional HID. Uh, so that alone is a reduction in energy costs and could certainly help your operating cost impact. Um, I think the other thing that, that people are learning is that HIDs have a large amount of radiant heat. I mean, you wouldn't want to hold your hand under an HID light for very long. You, you will burn it. Whereas an LED light, you can hold your hand under an LED light and you really, I mean, yes, there is some radiant heat, but it is not as intense. And the impact that that has on your, your product, your plant, is that that radiant heat is going to be, is going to hit the, lot, the leaf. So with HIDs, you tend to have a warmer leaf temperature than you do with an LED light. And we'll talk about that in a little bit, what that, how that impacts our HVAC loads. Uh, and, and what we need uh, to size for when we, when we talk about that. But I, I'm a big fan of the LED light technology right now because one, the, the price points keep coming down. Uh, they keep coming out with technology that, you know, here's a light spectrum that's focused on your bedroom. It's good for those small emerging plants. Uh, here's a light spectrum for the flower room. I mean, they are coming up with with these types of, of technology. And you've also got that ability to dim them. You can do sun upping, you can do sun downing uh, to help level out your, your impact for uh, just, you know, say flipping the switch from going from lights on to lights off. There are a lot of uh, impact there, but I know there are, are a lot of old school guys out there that still love their HID lights. We're fine with them. We just need to know what they, you know, what they are and, and how that impacts your crop. 
You're listening to Engineering Tomorrow. Always striving to bring you the best in commercial construction, design, and engineering. All right, so evapotranspiration is that latent load. So the lighting is the sensible load, meaning the temperature change load. It's adding heat to your room. The evapotranspiration is actually the humidity source. That's where the humidity comes from in your room. Um, if you have a poor system of removing the moisture, then humidity is going to be high and you may not be able to hit your set points. So that evapotranspiration is actually a combination of evaporation, which would come from your soil substrate, whatever that material might be, or it could be from if you're, a, if you're doing a poor job of, of watering the plants and you sling gallons of it on the floor, um, well, guess what? You're going to get evaporation off that concrete surface. That adds to your evaporation rate. So definitely be diligent and, and don't have a bunch of water on the floor um, or, or dripping from the ceiling or whatever. You know, keep that at bay because that will add to your load. The transpiration is actually the process where the plant pulls the moisture up through the stems, moves the nutrients out to the leaf structure, and then the water is excreted by the leaf uh, once it's moved the nutrients. That's the transpiration process. So now we have to be able to move that moisture off that leaf so that the next round of water and nutrients can be pulled up. Um, if we can't get the moisture off the leaf, then it's going to stymie the ability of the plant to take more moisture in. Paul, do you have a rule of thumb of water in versus water out? Yeah, actually, um, we, I got it right here on the next slide. I mean, water in mm -hmm. is water out. We, we pretty much say because we're not growing watermelons, um, day to day, the plant is not retaining a lot of moisture. Now, obviously the biomass does increase every day, but it's minuscule amount. So the easiest way for us to kind of calculate and, and understand that latent load is we just use water in it equals water out. Um, because it is that day to day, very small changes in the amount of water being retained by the plant. The majority of that water uptake is going to get transpired. And I think that's, that's one of the common, you know, misconceptions, right? Is, is the exact amount that's going to come through. They, you know, I know when I think when I water a plant outside that, you know, the water I'm giving it, that's what it's taking. And that's what it's using to grow. And that's why there's such a huge latent load here is because that's not actually the case. What we're putting into it is actually getting pulled from the substrate or whatever we're using to water, putting to the leaves and then moved and then we have to remove that from the air. Correct, correct. Now the other thing to keep in mind is the amount of water that is transpired is directly you know, related to the amount of energy in the room that can change it from a liquid to a gas. So you know this is one of the things that we always look when we, we at Desert Air we've uh, developed a, a questionnaire that goes out to the grower and we ask for water consumption and we also ask for lighting load. You know, how many watts of lights do you have in the room? And the reason we ask for that is because we want to make, well, one, we want to account for the load of the lighting for sensible, but we also want to know if you're telling me a consumption rate, if you tell me you've got a plant that's going to drink a, a gallon of water a day, I may call BS on you. If you don't have enough energy to actually trans, uh, allow for that transformation of liquid water off of the leaf to a gas. It takes 1,060 BTU of, uh, of energy to change a pound of water from a liquid to a gas. Um, now, I know, again, the finance guys out there, you're probably, your heads are spinning, mm -hmm. but you got to go back to your high school science, and there is a, there's a transformation there. Uh, there's a change of state that has to occur. Um, it's just like boiling water on the, uh, on the stove. Water's not going to boil without adding heat. So if you add your heat, it's going gonna, it's gonna to change state. Now, it is also a difference how much pressure is emitted on the top of that surface of water as to the rate at which water will leave. So that's why people always talk about, geez, I went to the mountains and I boiled my potatoes for 40 minutes and, geez, they were hard as rocks. Well, it boils at a lower temperature because there's less pressure being emitted by the atmosphere on the surface at a higher elevation. We actually look at the, the, the pressure that 
the air temperature and the relative humidity of the air around, uh, surrounding the, the leaf, that creates a vapor pressure, which is emitting onto the leaf. And when it gets too humid, there's uh, not much of a differential between the leaf's pressure and the air's pressure. So therefore, it can't leave. You have a high differential, the water leaves the leaf at a, at a high rate. So um, yeah, I know I went into probably a little more detail on what some people mm. wanted there, but th that is what's occurring. And uh, you know, when we get questionnaires back, we're looking at that and going, and, and we've got the history now as well to know, you know, if you're giving me a, a gallon of water per plant, I know there's no way in heck that that mm. plant is gonna drink a gallon of water a day unless you've come up with some species that is so much different than what everybody else is doing. Yeah, I'd say uh, the, you know, several projects that I've been involved in, there's been a decent amount of back and forth on it. Okay, here, we'll run it, but here's what you're telling us. This is, you know, you're going to win the Nobel Peace Prize. You're, you know, you're, you're creating energy at this point in time. Like, so, yeah. you know, let's, let's go back, talk to the, the cultivator and see, you know, get a better idea of what their watering rates are. It right. causes them to actually right. go back and, you know, they were kind of giving you an off the cuff number and they, you know, do a little study on it, realize, oh, okay, I'm actually, here's the watering rate that I'm actually using. Well, we keep in mind, sense. Eric, that we're not, we're asking for water consumption. We're sometimes getting the water rate and what people aren't keeping in mind is they're not telling us how much runoff they're getting. So a guy might be putting, I'm not doubting he's not putting a gallon per plant into the room, but I think he's failing to tell me that he's collecting in a bucket at the end of the, of the tray, he's recollecting, you know, a half of that or three quarters of that. And, and that's the part that, you know, what we're trying to understand is from a latent moisture removal requirement, how much equipment do we need to remove the moisture out of the air? We truly have to know how much water is getting into the air and it's got to evaporate or it's got to transpire. So if we have a bad, we have bad information, or if the number we're given is, is a massive number. Now we have some good tools. We got a, a tool called Penman Monteth that we're using these days and we're trusting it a lot more than we, we used to, but it's a, it's a tool that the government put together years ago to effectively estimate the water consumption of different plants in different climates to help people decide what to grow to feed themselves. And so we're getting some great information there and we've got enough history with the number of projects that we've done most of the time we have had projects that are oversized on the equipment more so than they've been undersized. The only time we've had projects undersized is when people say, Hey, I can only handle this amount of equipment or I only have this much electrical load. I'll adjust my plant count accordingly. And then they don't, they, they, <laughs> throw in the plants and they said they were going to, and now the equipment can't keep up. Um, but in more times than not, we end up with more equipment because people have given us, a number for the water consumption that isn't realistic or isn't occurring. Right. Uh, it, it's less than that. So again, another way to make sure that we're providing the right amount of equipment for the project is getting good data. Okay. And this is the picture that's stomata uh, again in the, in the cannabis plant, another, you know, uh, tip here is most of the stomata are actually on the underside of the leaf. They're called a dicot because of that. And, so if you think about that a second, more of the challenge is moving airflow such that we're getting air into that canopy and you know under the leaf where most of the water is coming out of that that plant leaf. Um, just an interesting nuance and just another challenge really. All right, so to better understand evaporative cooling, I like to use this example. I know everybody has been to Vegas or they've been to someplace out west, whether it be Phoenix or, or Santa Fe or, or Vegas, and you go to an outdoor bar in the middle of summer and they've got these misters. And you walk in off the street and it's just blazing hot. And then you walk into the outside bar and all of a sudden you're like, whoa, this is, this is a lot cooler in here. You know, and you look up and you got these little sprayers and you, you see all that mist coming out and you're going, well, geez, I'm not getting wet. What's happening? Well, this is the evaporative cooling effect. That water vapor that's being pumped out of those little misters 
it's actually water droplets, but before they can actually get to you, they are sucking heat out of, the, out of that area at the rate of 1,060 BTU per pound of water, and they're changing from a liquid to a gas. And so that's why you don't get wet, but because it's sucking that heat out of the area, it makes the area in the proximity of the mister cooler than the area away from the mister. And you know, this is that impact that we're having inside the room. So, you know, here's another, you know, uh, tip for you. You know, when you pick your equipment to do sensible cooling and you do it based on the lighting alone, or you do it based on the lighting at the beginning, what happens as the plants get bigger and they start going through more water? Yeah, what happens is those plants and the environment starts absorbing more energy of the light because of that 1060 BTU per pound of water. So the bigger the plants, the more evaporative cooling that they can do. Now, some people have heard of things called swamp coolers. Uh, swamp coolers are, are, they utilize evaporative cooling. So, um, but they don't work well if you have a high humid air being pushed across, um, you know, a media that has water on it. How is it going to really absorb any more water? It only works when you have the air around it is dry. And that's why we have to maintain the environment in a grow room at a dry enough condition at the proper Goldilocks condition so that it can absorb the moisture off the leaf and keep that happening continuously. Okay, so when we talk about the lights on, the lights on, you're gonna have that high sensible heat from the lights. You're gonna have the latent load from the evapotranspiration and you're gonna have that sensible cooling effect from the evaporation, the evaporative cooling effect. The bigger the plants get, the more water they're drinking, the more evaporative cooling you get that offsets the sensible heat from the lights. So in the, when we're in the lights on, we're gonna need cooling, uh, just temperature change, and we're gonna be de needing dehumidification. Now at the beginning, cooling will be, will be highest when the plants are small, but then as the plants grow, the sensible cooling need will drop and as the plants grow and they drink more water, the latent moisture removal goes up. So at the beginning when the plants are going in at say early flower, you don't have as much water consumption but you, and you don't have as much evaporative cooling. So you have high, a, high, a higher sensible uh, with less latent, but over that eight week flower room uh, period, your sensible cooling need is gonna go down and your latent moisture removal from dehumidification is gonna go up. So it's dynamic, it's changing, and it changes as the plants change. Now when we switch and go over to uh, lights off, when lights off, you don't have photosynthesis. And without photosynthesis, the plants really don't drink. Now there are some equations out there that say that they will continue to absorb some moisture uh, at, at nighttime and will continue to, uh, to transpire, but it's, it's at a, a significantly slower rate. I think I mentioned uh, earlier, um, the penman monteth equation and what we use at Desert Air is for flower rooms, 75% of the water uh, that's consumed by the plant occurs in that 12 hour lights off period. And only 25% of the water consumption for the day is transpired during the 12 hour lights off period. So if you made an assumption or if your engineer made an assumption that, geez, I got a 24 hour day, I got this much moisture remove, uh, divide it by 12, uh, and didn't apply the factor that only that 75% of it's going to happen in the lights off, you're going to be undersized in your lights on period. The other side of that coin is if you were relying on your air conditioner to remove moisture uh, during lights off, why would the air conditioner even run without the lighting load? It, it, it won't. I mean, unless there's some sort of heat gain coming from the external walls or somewhere else in the room, we don't need to be adding much cooling, if at all any, during the lights on period. So we're, our primary load with lights off is gonna be a dehumidification load and only a dehumidification load. Now possibly it could need some heat and that's where it comes in, us understanding that heat loss equation. So take a winter month and you've got external walls, you have two, say you've got two external walls on this particular flower room over in the corner of your building and it's 10 degrees outside we could see the temperature in the flower room 
during lights off drop rather dramatically if you don't have a good insulation on that. And that's why we ask for, are we, uh, do we have any external heat gain or heat loss? All right, well, now that we kind of set the stage for what goes on in the grow room, um, what we want to talk about is how do we do it efficiently? How do we select efficient HVAC? So, you know, in the lighting, in the lights on period, we talked about the need for sensible cooling and for dehumidification. And in the lights off mode, we talked about dehumidification only and possibly heating. Um, so let's, uh, let's check. So comfort cooling equipment. Um, and just so everybody understands what I'm talking about when I say comfort cooling. So anything to do with, uh, say, a standard commercial building um, HVAC, uh, a packaged rooftop, a packaged air conditioning rooftop, um, a VRF system, a uh, data center type of unit, anything that is sized to do temperature control as its primary function is kind of that comfort cooling equipment that I'm speaking to. And so if you compare the needs for comfort cooling, you know, an office environment, you know, your operating modes, you're gonna have an occupied and an unoccupied. You're gonna have points in time where you're there and you want a condition. And when you, when you leave at work at night to save some energy, you know, you raise the temperature in the room a little bit during summertime, you don't, you don't, you don't want to cycle the cooling as much. You want to keep the electricity uh, consumption down. So you change the set point. Um, your lighting is typically, you know, 0.7 to 1.2 watts per square foot. Um, space temperatures 70 to 75, 50 60 percent RH is a nice comfort zone for, for comfort for commercial buildings. There is an outdoor air requirement for commercial buildings. Again, I spoke to this earlier, ASHRAE 62.1 is the code ventilation requirement for commercial buildings um, so that we, we don't choke on our own fumes. And certainly now during the coronavirus thing, people are talking about, do we, will we be changing that ASHRAE 62.1 uh, code requirement to bring in more outside air for the occupied space? Yeah, maybe, right? Uh, and then carbon dioxide, effectively, we're getting diluted through the amount of vent ventilation air that we bring in. Uh, but now we start talking about cannabis and indoor plants, whether it be lettuces or cannabis, but I know you guys are the cannabis crowd. We have lights on and we have lights off uh, as opposed to occupied, occup unoccupied. The plants are there both times. We just change the loads rather significantly. Lighting is gonna be somewhere between 30 to 80 watts per square foot. Um, for instance, I know the state of Illinois, I think, has put a requirement in that your lighting load cannot exceed 36 watts per square foot. What they're trying to do is drive people to more efficient lighting methods and keep the electrical grid somewhat in check. Um, I know the state of Massachusetts has uh, a condition, uh, I think it's 34 watts per square foot out there, and they've been very successful in um, keeping the energy consumption down in some of the grow rooms because of what they're trying to drive on the lighting requirement. Space temperatures, we're going to see anywhere from 65 to 83. And then, you know, you, you guys are kind of across the map. You know where your, your secret sauce is, where your, your, uh, your temperature and humidity may be through this cycle. I mean, bedroom, you tend to be a little warmer, maybe that 82, 83. Um, you can be a little more humid because you don't want to just have that plant dry out. You're trying to retain some of that moisture so it can actually produce more biomass. Uh, when you get into the flower room, you know, you're going to be maybe in that 75 to, to, to 80 degree temperature, um, you know, at that 55 to 65 sort of relative humidity. And then there is no ventilation requirement. Um, and again, if you did have ventilation, uh, how does that impact CO2? I mean, one of the things that we've talked about with CO2, we're we're doing CO2 injection uh, into the cannabis rooms because people have figured out that um, CO2 absorption, when it's at a parts per million of 1,200 to 1,500 parts per million, you get better plant growth. You get a quicker plant growth. So normally occurring CO2 is about 400 parts per million. So if you bring in a lot of ventilation air, uh, you're going to go through a lot more CO2 trying to maintain a higher CO2 level. So uh, certainly that's a big difference between the comfort cooling side of the equation. So there are some significant differences there. And, and uh, you know, as we get into it, you'll see more about it. 
when we talk about the, you know, inefficient method to, to do a, a grow room, it's, it's really the, the cheap method. It's buying an air conditioner and then buying portables. Uh, they are easy to install. They're, they are cheap first cost. You can typically find these off the shelf. That just means you're not doing planning very well if you're just trying to get the first thing available in the market. But, you know, the, the big impact here is you're going to have higher operating costs. Um, air conditioners are not efficient at moisture removal. They're good at temperature control. That's what they're sized for, but they're not good at moisture removal. So you got to look at what you're trying to accomplish. If you're going to have, try to throw these into your, uh, your money room, which is your flower room, and that's also the high latent load, is that the right product for you? And then we start talking about these portables. Most of the portable units that people are, are using these days, they reject their heat to the space. So what I mean by that, if a unit takes 75 degrees into it to, to, to remove moisture, the leaving air temperature of that will probably be about 95. So now you're putting heat back in the room from this operating unit. It's not connected to something to reject the heat from uh, compression. Um, so, you know, the more these run, the more heat it puts in a room, that becomes very inefficient because now this air conditioner has to run more frequently to keep the temperature down. So what we find is operating costs with this method are more than if you had a purpose-built, um, you know, uh, temperature and humidity machine. Well, and how do you get those two to work together in tandem, right? I mean, you're, yeah. you're two independent units at different right. control points. and Well, and, and we always say uh, we've had guys that they'll have, maybe they'll have 20 or 30 of these portables in a room. And there comes a point in time where they want to change the set point. <laughs> now what? They're going to go around to 20, 30 of those in each room and make a lot of adjustment. They're not working together. Um, they're working independently. So again, you can elect to do that, but that's another aspect of this business that over time, labor is going to be a significant impact to your ability to grow, uh, to your growing costs. So if you're spending labor to hand water, if you're spending labor to go and change set points manually and not be automated, um, you're probably going to see yourself not as, a, not as cost effective as somebody else who does. Well, and you mentioned that through the eight week, week flowering period that, you know, you're basically it, it's changing, right? It's not like you're going to go in and set right. it once and it's going to be fine. I mean, you know, what you're doing this week is going to change from what you're doing next week. So it's not like you're ever going to encounter the time where you don't need to change the set points. Yeah. We've started asking people, um, especially for the flower room, typically four different windows of, of temperature control and humidity control th through that eight to nine week flower room. You know, when the, when the plants first go into that flower room, they, there may be a transition period from veg to flower where they don't use the full lighting impact because the plant can't absorb it all anyway. So why waste it? And they tend to be at a, a little warmer temperature uh, as they're getting acclimated to this, this new room. I mean, again, they moved the plants. So they're trying to get them acclimated. They might do that for a week or two. And then you start changing the temperature and the set point as that plant starts getting bigger and, and going through its, its load. And then the other thing is people like to change the temperature towards the end of the cycle. Um, because they're trying to direct that plant to focus on the flower and produce more resin. You know, it's that end of life. The plant will actually uh, create more resin, more sticky substance to try to collect pollen. They haven't pollinated yet. So the, the female plant's trying to figure out, how do I collect pollen? And, you know, it just starts, you know, really impacting there at the end. And plus you're looking at, some of the guys are looking to dry the plant out a little bit. So they'll, they'll actually cut a lot of the biomass off that doesn't have flour on it. So the photosynthesis uh, uh, quantity goes down because there's less biomass. So they can actually move the temperatures down a little bit and not affect what equipment they sized. So a lot of that, you know, it's, it's a complicated deal. You have to take it all in consideration. So here's a, a, an example of a project that we worked on at Desert Air uh, several years ago. Um, the first phase was, uh, done with portables and air conditioners. And this is a, if you're not familiar with it, it's a four day trend line, a trend graph. Temperature is in the top, or in the top and relative humidity is down on the bottom. Um, but the, the yellow is the lights on period. The white is the lights off period. So you've got four cycles here, four days, four 24 hour periods. And you can see they were 
they were trying to maintain 75 degree Fahrenheit at about 50%, you know, 52% relative humidity. And you can see that they did a piss poor job. Of doing it. <laughs> I mean, Way I'm off. off. <laughs> yeah. I mean, this isn't even, uh, you know, this, I know it's kind of hard to see, but this is 90 degrees on this uh, band up here. And uh, here's 70. So there's a 20 degree span and they're even going outside of that on the four day window. And the relative humidity uh, is going everywhere from as low as 25 to as high as 85%. Uh, now, we all know that relative humidity does change a little bit, does change with a change in temperature because it is relative, but it's not a stable environment. Um, this particular grower sought us out uh, for his phase two, and we installed desert air equipment, which is purpose built with, you know, we control temperature and humidity moisture removal with the one machine. And we'd like to do two machines that work together in a room so that we have more stages of operation. And this is what it, you know, his facility looked like afterwards. He's maintaining his temperature and you can see now there's a little blip there and where the blip, what causes the blip? Guess what? Lights on to lights off, right? Or lights off to lights on. You have this huge temperature change done with the flip of a switch. He didn't do any sun downing or sun upping. He either, he just turned the lights off. And when it came time to turn them on, boom, they were all on. So that's why I say, you know, the, the, some of the benefits with LEDs being able to do um, um, changes in, in intensity, uh, being able to do that, that sun upping over 30 minutes or sun downing over a 30 minute window would actually level out these little peaks. Uh, and in dew point, which if you have stable dew point, this is absolute moisture. If we have stable dew point, we have stable VPD. Now, we haven't talked about VPD yet, but that's vapor pressure deficit. And that's an absolute moisture issue. And this is telling me I have, I have a stable temperature and I have a stable humidity. So I've got an ideal climate to maximize my growth. This guy indicated to us that his growth rate, his yield increased 25%. Uh, I mean, he paid back our, our equipment within a year. Um, it was just, it was, he was a fan. So uh, I'm bringing it up just because that's something you have to look at. Yes, I'm more expensive than that in inefficient product. But if you're in this for a few years, why not do it right and, uh, and try to keep your costs down? So let's take a look at uh, purpose-built product. Um, at Desert Air, we do uh, a purpose-built product. We, we we originated back in 1978 as a dehumidification centric product. I've always, I always tell people, yeah, we're in the HVAC industry. We do not make air conditioners. We make dehumidification systems that control temperature. Uh, and, and that's the big difference. Yes, we have compressors. So do carrier units. So do York units. But our compressors are used for moisture removal and then temperature control Whereas the air conditioner family out there, they're doing temperature control. And then it's, oh, by the way, I have a little bit of moisture removal. I can provide to you when, my, when I'm running based on temperature. So my units run based on whether there's a need for temperature or they run based on whether there's a need for dehumidification. Um, we have this thing called a modulating hot gas reheat coil and it's full sized. And that allows us to rewarm the air that we've cooled in order to remove the moisture out of the air we get to rewarm that air for free. It's energy we've already spent. We're not having to, to fire up an electric heater or a gas furnace to bring the temperature back up after cooling it down uh, to remove moisture. Um, so again, another energy efficient method. Um, so that's, that's what we're doing. And, and again, we've got these units that we can do as indoor, um, either air cooled or water cooled units. This is a room, the one in the, in the background is a, is a project over in Massachusetts. Uh, these two units are working together for this little flower room on the other side. Uh, this was a four story uh, shoe factory from, that was about 130 years old that the grower bought for a very inexpensive price mm -hmm. in downtrodden Western Massachusetts. And so we're growing product on four floors. Uh, so now they're not, they're not air cooled units, but they're water cooled. He's got a water line running around to it and we're just rejecting our heat. Whatever waste heat we have from the equipment is being dumped into that water loop that goes out and then is being um, 
cooled by a cooling tower. But, um, you know, we can do these as air cooled, water cooled, but these two units work together to maintain that environment on the other side of the wall. This project here down in the foreground, uh, these are um, our units on the roof. They are air cooled packaged units for dehumidification and temperature control. And you can see there's a whole slew of those bad boys. These two here are working together. The next two are working together. The next two, I think there's probably about 30 of these units on that project. Um, and uh, again, you know, it's just, it's where do you want to put the equipment? That was what that comes down to. These both operate the same way. These up here in the background are a little smaller, but we also have sizes up to this size. This guy here just wanted to put his units on the roof. Uh, he didn't want to take up space inside the building. The folks here in Massachusetts, because they were on four stories, if you can imagine, if you tried to put stuff on up on the fourth, up on the, on the roof, how do you get the equipment, how do you get the airflow all the way back down to the, to the first floor? It would be cumbersome to try to, to run ductwork uh, up and down to do that. So, uh, and the other thing is this equipment will operate year round. Uh, we've got equipment that's outdoors operating up in Alberta, Canada, and it gets to minus 40 degrees Fahrenheit in the winter. And this equipment is operating. Now I know most of the folks, yeah, of course it operates. It's, it's heating. Well, no, it's not. It's dehumidifying. It's the refrigeration system is operating. You, air conditioners aren't meant to operate in the dead of winter. Uh, now some are if they're data center type units, uh, but a data center type unit doesn't really have a need to remove a bunch of moisture. So think about the origin of the product that you're, uh, that you're considering and what was, it, what was its intended purpose and what's your purpose. I think that's the best way to try to explain. Wow, that was an awesome episode. For more information, go to midwestmachinery.net, engineeringtomorrow.blog, or desertair.com. We will see you all again very soon. Until next time, keep engineering for tomorrow today. Thanks for joining us on Engineering Tomorrow. If you liked the show, please take a moment to subscribe on iTunes or Spotify. For even more great engineering or construction knowledge, visit engineeringtomorrow.blog.